Welcome back to our series of videos on domes. This video will explore the effect on structural action of the dome of removing some of the parts of the dome. A complete dome is a marvelously efficient structure for resisting all of the common, highly distributed loads such as gravity, wind, and seismic. If we begin to violate parts of the structure, we can better understand how the dome is behaving. For example, under gravity loads, represented by this hand pressing down on the top of the dome, the tension material circling the dome is crucial to tying it together and making it work. Just like arches that don't have buttressing action tend to splay apart and act like beams instead of like arches, um, there are elements holding the dome together that are making the arch-like uh, action or the compressive action of the dome possible. The complete dome is also very effective in resisting wind forces from any direction. On the other hand, if we remove the side walls of the dome, then the resistance to wind is drastically diminished. These side walls are acting like shear walls. Um, and even though the sphere, the dome is spherical in shape, it has uh, effectively windward surfaces and side wall surfaces, and those side walls are acting as shear walls in resisting the wind load. Now, suppose we want to increase access to the dome by removing some structural elements at the base of the dome. In this diagram, we're looking at three structural frames made out of aluminum tubing. At the left is the complete dome. In the structure in the center, every other bipod support at the base of the dome has been removed. So in other words, that bipod right there has been removed on the structure to provide a kind of doorway. Because if we try to walk through this triangle here, people would be inclined to hit their shoulders or possibly hit their heads on these sloped elements. So by removing every other bipod, we're effectively creating doorways. Uh, this structure removes the same bipods and also removes every other horizontal element in this bottom tension hoop. <clears throat> this is the result of the analysis of these three structures under the axial for or getting the axial forces uh, under gravity force. In this case, the yellow flags indicate axial compression force. The cyan flags indicate axial tension. At the left is the complete dome with constant tension on the lowest hoop. In the center dome, removing every other bipod at the base has doubled the axial force in the remaining bipods. So you'll notice here these flags have a certain size when we have all the bipods there. Those flags double in size when we remove half of those support elements because the remaining half has to take up twice as much force. Removing those bipods has also altered the balance of forces at the joints in the lower hoops. So we're talking about these joints right there. <clears throat> the horizontal component of the force of a bipod strut at that joint, or one of those joints, is not countered by the horizontal component of an adjacent bipod strut. That adjacent bipod strut has been removed. This unbalanced horizontal force of the bipod strut is absorbed in the hoop members, creating some tension in the hoop member on one side. So it's creating more tension here and some compression in this member. 
And in this case, the horizontal component of those bipods incident on these joints is less than the original tension in this hoop. So what is happening is the effect of this bipod is to increase slightly the tension in that member and diminish the tension in this member. So we no longer have this perfectly uniform tension around this ring, but we have higher tension, somewhat lower tension, higher tension, lower tension, and so forth. <clears throat> so the middle, for the middle structure, the lowest hoop is still in tension everywhere, but the tension varies up and down from one segment to the next. For the structure on the right, the tension hoop on the bottom has been uh, annihilated, in effect. It's no longer able to serve its function of helping to hold the dome together. And all those hoop forces have gotten transferred up to the hoop just above that. And those forces have been doubled. So uh, still looking at gravity forces, we're going to look at bending stresses in these three structures. You'll notice that both of these domes under gravity loads are still well behaved in that uh, there are essentially no bending stresses and the dome is performing as a proper compression structure carrying the loads to the ground. On the other hand, for this particular structure, they're very disturbing uh, bending stresses which are being uh, induced and those were not intended as part of the original design of the structure. And we can get a better sense of all of that by looking at the deflection and you'll notice these two structures are exhibiting a very minute deflection whereas there is a tendency for this structure to bulge outward fairly dramatically uh, where that hoop has been uh, eliminated. So the tendency to bulge outward is still there. There's no tension member to hold it back in. And the net effect is we're inducing very severe bending stresses to keep this structure working. Now under wind force, the bending stresses are a bit more complicated. This is the complete structure and notice it still has no bending stresses in it. We're beginning to see some significant bending stresses in this structural system. Uh, and of course, this one is still very seriously flawed in terms of its structural action. So what we're going to do for the moment is we're going to say this one is just not working well and we're going to discard it from our consideration. We don't want to give up on this one, though, because these openings to get people in and out of the building are pretty crucial. And from an architectural point of view, this solution is not very satisfactory, even though it is working beautifully from a structural point of view. So we're going to go in and we're going to examine this one in the context of that and ask ourselves, how do we fix this one so it works? So these are those two structural frames um, rendered. This is the wind force deformation you'll notice that what's happening here is this tension structure is the beginning or the tension hoop is developing a wiggle. So under a wind force to the right here, um, this bending, the entire structure is trying to move that way. Um, this member is going into tension. That one's going into compression. So that one is ramming outward and this one is sucking the hoop point inward. And we can see that a little bit better in this plan view where you see this sort of wiggle that's occurring in that hoop. So the hoop is deforming a lot and that gives us a hint that that's where we need to do some work. And the logical response to that wiggle is to give those members some beam-like structure. And again, this is, these are the bending stresses we're looking at. Um, and we, these are the things we want to get rid of. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to give this hoop 
some bending qualities in the horizontal plane. So we're going to, in this uh, simulation, we're turning that into an I-beam. And by the way, you'll notice it's not a very deep I-beam. It's set horizontal because that's where the big deformations are occurring. And we would like to keep that a nice clean circle in order for the structure to behave well. So this shows the structure um, with in going from the original one, which did not have that beam-like qualities, to this new one, which does have the beam-like qualities. And you'll notice that we have drastically reduced the deformation in the structure by giving that hoop beam-like strength in the horizontal direction. Now, <clears throat> to give you a working example of this, um, compensating for missing parts of the dome, this is the standard connection detail on the charter sphere which was designed by Thomas C. Howard. Um, note the standard two-bolt connection at each end, which gives some moment capacity, but not a great deal. This is a charter sphere where you'll notice those bipods have been removed to provide access um, to the bottom of the dome. And this is a close-up that gives you an idea of how that hoop problem was solved. Uh, rather than put in a, a, a wide flange shape here and turn it horizontal and have to invent a whole new uh, member type and new connection type, what was done was this tube was stiffened by using a tube with a much thicker wall. And then the connection detail was made with four bolts instead of two. And then the wall thickness of this particular hub was also enhanced so that the hub could transfer moments through. So there was no radical redesign, um, just those tweaks to the system, but generally staying within the system. So rather than inventing an entirely new type of member and a new type of connection to address the special case of stiffening this hub. This is a classic dome home where key triangulation has been removed right down here to accommodate and here, by the way, and up there and up there. <clears throat> This triangulation has been removed to accommodate vertical walls with standard window and door details. The structural effect of these design adjustments are similar to those caused by removing the bipods in the charter spheres that we were just talking about. Often the designers of dome homes have not had the same structural understanding that Thomas Howard had in making the adjustments to the charter sphere which has sometimes led to structural problems with dome homes. This is Kresge Auditorium at MIT. It was designed by Aero Saarinen. While this roof structure is spherical in shape, the structure is not behaving at all like a dome since there are no tension hoops to hold it together. In the original conception, the designers believed that the roof would be totally self-supporting. It was spherical, and therefore they presumed dome-like in its behavior. They also believed that under thermal expansion, the roof would have to move independently of the mullions in the walls, and they actually originally detailed all the connections in the building to allow that to happen. The designers were widely quoted as saying that the dome would breathe independently of the walls. This expression captured people's imagination and was widely quoted. After the concrete roof structure was cast and given some time to cure, the construction team began removing formwork. It became apparent quickly that the structure was deforming too much and that it would collapse. 
The form of course put back in place and the mullions in the walls were redesigned and made an integral part of the structure for resisting gravity loads. It is a commentary on the literature of architecture that the expression that the dome would breathe independently of the walls was widely quoted long after the building was constructed in a completely different manner than this original intent. Sometimes structures, domical shapes, can be stabilized with deep elements around the boundary. <clears throat> in the case of the structure in the upper left hand corner, it is a network dome where crucial parts of the dome have been removed and compensation has been made for that by creating deep trusses around the boundary that help hold the shape of the dome. This is similar to the techniques that we discussed earlier for stiffening an arch against roll-through deformation, which is in effect you provide additional thickness for it. In the image on the right, the structure has been stiffened by thickening the entire shell everywhere. The edge of this dome has been stiffened by adding more thin shell that more or less mirrors the dome across the plane containing the glazed opening. So in other words, there's a vertical plane right here and a vertical plane right there. And this exterior material is basically mimicking the form of the arch on the other side of the dome on the other side of that plane. In addition to providing structural stiffening, this external thin shell provides solar shading and directs rainwater on the dome down to leaders at the support points. So water can be taken off the roof here as opposed to sort of flowing in an uncontrolled way across the roof. This is a very wide angle view of the interior of that space. The dome with omnidirectional glazing is an excellent way of focusing natural light on a central exhibit. In this case, a replica of the Wright Flyer. This is a very beautiful and elegant little space that's perfect for the use to which it's being put. Domes that do not meet the foundation all around, but are supported on a few points will have very high force concentrations at the support points. This dome geometry is an example of a way of configuring the material to handle that very non-uniform state of stress. So in this case, all these structural elements in the dome are congregating together or converging on these support points. And in the conceptualization of this dome, these elements are creating a lower spherical surface. And then sitting on top of that are these elements, which provide a very uh, clean method of patterning the decking that's going to go on the roof. Uh, this is a different view of that point supported dome. That ends our lecture on the effect of removing parts of a dome on the structural action of the dome.